Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the webinar today called Measuring LEDs and Lasers for Near IR Sensing Applications. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us here today, and uh, thanks also to John and Laser Focus World for hosting us. So just a little background about Radiant Vision Systems. Our core business is in light and color measurement, and for over 25 years, we've been designing and manufacturing scientific grade color emitters and photometers, uh, photometric solutions to support our customers worldwide. So we're based in uh, Redmond, Washington, and we have offices around the world to help uh, support applications. For example, uh, when they reach uh, Southeast Asia, mainland China, we can support our customers uh, as the applications migrate uh, uh, worldwide. So today I'm happy to share some of our expertise in light-based sensing applications, and then also introduce camera and software technology for light source measurement. So the agenda is, well, we'll talk about sensing with light, so we'll talk about background and applications of near IR light, and then talk about the light sources themselves, both LEDs and lasers, their benefits and applications, performance considerations when selecting one or the other, and then we'll wrap up with measuring near our sources, both the traditional methods and challenges, as well as um, uh, solu uh, potential solution for all lighting geometries. And then lastly, we'll do a, a quick summary. So briefly, I want to touch on the applications brought to us by NearIR Infrared Light and present some of the emerging applications from everything from consumer devices to, uh, to traditional AR, VR. Often we think of the visible attributes of our devices, specifically maybe the display or the buttons if they still have them, but what about the in invisible? Uh, Near IR light allows us to unlock our phones with our faces, optimize AR, VR experiences with gestures and eye movements, and now our vehicles are becoming more aware of their surroundings, too, in order to enable autonomous driving. Uh, you're likely already familiar with many light-based sensing applications, starting in the, in the top left there, facial recognition for biometric ID, device security, and personalization. Um, moving objects leverage sensing for proximity detection, and we see this in LiDAR and other autonomous vehicle operations. Um, very common now to see gesture recognition for touchless device control. Uh, position tracking to determine where users' objects are in space. Um, we see this a lot in AR, VR operation. Eye tracking, seeing a lot more of this, optimizing AR and VR visualization, um, and then also in automotive for head-up display rendering and driver awareness monitoring. And lastly, we have simultaneous localization and mapping, uh, conveniently, which comes with its own acronym called SLAM. And with this, we can construct a 3D environment while tracking object and user location. So in, in effect, understanding real-world spaces for AR and creating virtual worlds uh, for, for VR. Okay. Let's talk about uh, near, IR, near, near IR light itself. It's one of the predominant signals used for remote sensing in all of the devices discussed. So the wavelengths are above the visible spectrum, ranging from about 780 nanometers to 1400 nanometers, and then sometimes we extend that to 2500 nanometers uh, for the inclusion of short wavelength infrared. And conveniently for us, these wavelengths are invisible to the human eye. So they're not distracting to us. They make a convenient vehicle for solving the, the use cases that, that we already discussed. Um, so near IR light it isn't impacted by visible light, and it can operate effectively in any ambient light condition, it's in effect seeing better than the human eye or vision cameras uh, day or night. And then the systems function by receiving an near IR signal from the environment. So it's cast into the environment, and then that light eliminates an area for an IR sensitive camera, for example, to, uh, to, to see the environment. And then it can also be pulsed or cast into dot patterns um, to be used to determine object depth, curvature, uh, shape, size, those types of things. Okay. So when we think about the applications themselves, what wavelengths do they fit into? Um, initially, eye tracking and object detection applications began at around 780. 
but there's some issues with human visibility at this wavelength, so they've moved on to other wavelengths, which we'll discuss. Night vision and security cameras, they typically use a wavelength of 850. Uh, some LIDAR systems rely on 905, and we'll, we'll come back to that in a second here. And then here we see facial recognition at 850 and 940, and in another slide we'll talk about why that is, uh, that it's moved to those uh, wavelengths. At the 1040 to 1060 range, we're starting to see now terrestrial LIDAR for mapping and modeling. 1050 is also known uh, for food analysis and moisture detection and for some medical applications. 1300 or around that range, we also have seen some of this at, at 850 and 1550, but uh, for instances um, at 1300, there's, it's a higher range for transmissibility, so we're starting to see fiber optic communications at this, this range. And then, you know, more commonly now, you're starting to see LIDAR developing towards 1550 because it can be emitted at a higher intensity while remaining safe for uh, human visual exposure. So let's talk about what's in a wavelength and um, why would we choose one or the other. Sometimes the, the sensor itself that's chosen for detecting the near eye reflections may be sensitive to a particular wavelength of light, or the light at a given wavelength may produce a stronger signal because of the effects of atmospheric absorption at that wavelength. So that's what this chart really shows. It's a chart of irradiance uh, versus wavelength. and it's telling us that the sun's output includes near IR light, of course, which can interfere with the signal of a near IR source's output. So at certain wavelengths on the near IR spectrum, the sunlight's near IR emissions are absorbed by, by things in the environment, uh, things in the atmosphere, excuse me. And this is illustrated by the dips here that you see in the red band. So you see one about 750, the next one you see is, is about um, uh, conveniently 940, which we'll talk about. And because of this, um, because of this, we're starting to see some of the migration of facial ID to, uh, to 940. And that's because of this dip that you see here, uh, right at the, the, the 940 wavelength. So uh, there, there's a dip in, in the sunlight's irradiance, irradiance at this point, and uh, 940 sources produce more reliable signals, and so they're being chosen for a, a larger number of consumer sensing applications today where we don't have distractions from, from sunlight. Okay, so let's shift to um, some of the trends in consumer electronics. Um, the range of use cases for near IR has proliferated, of course, across many devices. So you see them today in phones, tablets, laptops, monitors, you name it. Um, but what we're showing here specifically is, is for facial recognition, which provides, again, biometric authentication for device security and also for personalization. Um, before that step, before we're able to uh, perform facial ID, though, near IR light is used to simply detect when a user's face is even present in front of a device and then also how to focus optics for facial recognition later. Um, and you may hear this referred to as the flood source that's providing the light for this. In terms of gesture recognition, um, perhaps our first common introduction to gesture recognition occurred with Microsoft's Connect or uh, Nintendo's Wii, where near IR light enabled them to detect user features and movements and then match these on screen for the purposes of gaming. Um, of course, it's since evolved to provide touch-free interfacing for, for other consumer devices. So, in the image, images on the right here, we show some examples from UltraLeap. Uh, they provide gesture control interfaces for consumer devices, AR, VR, and then also retail applications. Um, and then one thing to note here, right, so this is gesture recognition for um, touchless control. So it's likely, given um, um, current events that we're in, that we'll continue to see more sensor-based controls for hands-free operation, uh, given some new health and safety standards. So it'll be important to track that. Eye tracking, also useful for touchless interface uh, with electronic devices. Here on the right, we have two examples from Toby in the upper right image where eye tracking in a laptop PC is used. And it's used here to control the desktop software, uh, move it back and forth and make certain selections. In the lower right, we uh, show eye tracking in high-end gaming. And uh, this allows for dynamic changes to be made based on the gamer's gaze. So in this case, 
you can see the, the shadow sort of tracking around in the image there, and that's uh, Toby's ghost feature that provides a visual, visual indicator as to where the gamer is uh, actually looking on screen. Okay, uh, near IR light is uh, also really useful as an interface in the AR and VR applications where we're trying to limit buttons or controls. So fewer com components of these devices makes them lighter, makes them more integrated, makes them more easy to use. So with near IR light, the headset basically becomes an extension of our bodies. Um, and as networking in virtual spaces becomes uh, more the norm these days, uh, facial recognition can typically be used to uh, create a near IR model of a user's feature for rendering. Um, and then also eye movements and facial expressions can dynamically animate the user's avatar in the VR space. So um, sometimes you also see this on the AR space with um, the filters that, that are used on our phones. In this example, the image on the left is HTC's Vive facial tracker which was developed uh, to capture facial expressions and precise mouth movements, and, and as I mentioned, for avatar rendering. And on the right, we show Osram gives us an example of how near IR sensing could be used for user detection. Um, and this is similar to how smartphone facial ID scans for the user presence. Um, so as an example, if the, you put the eyeglasses up to your, to your head, turning on the display when the sensor detects that the user has put the headset on, and then turning it off when uh, the user uh, takes the headset off to help with power consumption. Okay. In AR VR, eye tracking um, also has a range of applications. It can detect the position and movement of the user's eyes as well as the pupil dilation. And this is typically done by integrating near IR LEDs around the viewing lenses or eyepieces of the headset near the eye. Um, on the left, we show a couple examples of near IR LEDs and IR cameras and headsets. The top is an aftermarket component by People Labs, uh, and that's within, shown within an HTC Vive headset. And on the bottom, we see integrated LEDs for the Magic Leap 1 and the HoloLens 2 uh, mixed reality headsets. So to track eyes using light, it requires detecting the pupil and then using reflections, um, corneal reflections, uh, to determine the pupil center. And then the relative locations of each will indicate the gaze direction. So near IR light is perfect for this application because it doesn't, um, users don't see it when it's cast into their eyes, but then also because near IR images tend to be higher contrast than, uh, than visible uh, images. So. Also, uh, visible light can generate some uncontrolled specular reflection off the eye, and near IR, near IR light behaves differently, allowing uh, better differentiation between the pupil um, and the iris to determine the, the shape and size. Uh, one other application of eye tracking in, in HMDs or head-mounted displays is to simulate how users visualize the real world. So, in this example, foveated rendering provides highest quality visuals where the user is focusing um, or at the, the fovea, and then um, quality is reduced in the periphery. So here, an image from Toby in the upper left illustrates this concept. Um, it helps achieve virtual images with higher frame rates, more detail, and greater contrast in specific areas. And then because processing, processing is focused, so to speak, at a specific area at a given time, it reduces processing load on the system, it reduces power consumption, and then also increases uh, display life cycles. Uh, the lower left graphic shows NVIDIA's variable rate, rate shading, um, also called VRS, and more pixels are processed for virtual shading operations in the pupil area, which is shown here as the blue, the darker blue circle. And then graphics will dynamically adjust as the eye moves, putting most detail in the area of focus. And then also within AR, VR, there's some other capabilities to discuss here. One would be device interfacing. So to reduce the effects of the controls here, um, to interact with, with objects, a, a user could simply look at it, right? So gaze could create a cursor at the point of focus, and then selections could be made by hovering for a period of time, or by com combining gaze with a voice or gesture command. And so this could eliminate icons and, and other things that clutter visuals on screen and reduce some complexity. 
Uh, on the left, we show an image from Microsoft's developer guide for HoloLens uh, mixed reality headsets. And eye tracking here enables setting a virtual cursor on the environment where the user is looking. Um, and then click actions can, of course, be made using methods like gestures and voice. And then one other application would be IPD, or setting the interpupillary distance, um, which for most adults ranges from about five to eight centimeters. And so if you're ever with friends or family looking through binoculars, you, you know this, this uh, conundrum, right? Everybody has to manipulate the, the binoculars to, to look at them to accommodate um, the, the distance between their pupils. So traditionally in VR headsets, this was done as a manual process. But now calculating IPD using near AR pupil detection automates the adaptation to uh, unique facial features, improving comfort and, uh, and quality. OK, a couple more here on the trends. Um, this, again, continues with AR VR. This is position tracking. So we have two examples here. One is outside in tracking, which places near IR cameras and sensors around the periphery of the room to, um, to find the user. But this, of course, potentially limits the user to util utilizing VR only within a small zone. OK. And then inside-out tracking uses near-IR emitters and sensors in the headset to determine the user's position. Um, uh, one other note here, inside-in tracking, there can be sensors that detect the relative position of the user's head and their hands. So this might allow the, UR, the VR environment to track the locations relative to virtual objects and create the user's avatar movement. Um, the example on the right shows the, the sensors in an Oculus uh, headset and controllers track the, the user's uh, arm movements. OK. So I mentioned SLAM earlier. So in effect, this is um, a way to use sensing to understand the real world environment and give users freedom to wander the environment and also see how um, virtual icons or items might be seen in a real world environment. So in AR and um, um, augmented reality and mixed reality, SLAM is used to, to place virtual objects in the real world. And then the sec sensing uh, technologies of the headset provide an understanding of three, 3D areas uh, and surfaces, enabling visualization of objects um, to the correct size, shape, and location. So the example on the left lets the users place virtual furniture to see how it'll look in their room. And then in the context of VR, SLAM can use uh, sensing for obstacle awareness. Um, so while users are exploring their virtual environments, the headset can give visual cues when they're nearing or going through um, guardian zones that we see like in the Quest 2. And then the image on the right here is um, a company called Occip Occipital that uses a sensor to map the room um, and partially reveal it during immersive play. And then uh, this is 3D mapping for AR, VR. So again, um, this enables SLAM to, to map the, the surrounding environment. And here's an example that was presented at a recent SID chapter event showing how sensing is used to map real world objects and then render them potentially as new and different virtual objects in the AR world, or in the VR world, excuse me. And all of this, of course, is very challenging to do on the fly. And then as we mentioned, we're seeing more of this uh, also in automotive uh, benefits of, of near IR sensing, uh, not just for LIDAR, but also in driver monitoring systems. So those will track the presence and position of drivers, uh, as you see there on, on the left, uh, for head rotation and posture, and then eye tracking uh, to ensure that the driver is looking at the road and isn't, isn't becoming drowsy or distracted. Um, heads up display is also adopting eye tracking to optimize virtual images. And uh, eye tracking can help make images appear in areas where the driver's gaze is located and render images that look 3D or holographic to the driver based on stereoscopic vision. And this is an example from Panasonic that, um, where it's, it's used to project a virtual image correctly independent of where the driver is looking. So if the system notices the driver's head is turned, it adjusts the, the HUD elements uh, being projected uh, to compensate. Okay. And then last but, but not least is uh, healthcare. And again, in, in current events um, that, that make this 
especially relevant, um, we can think of sensing here in the healthcare environments as a means of eliminating touch controls. So this will help reduce points of human contact and then, of course, improve uh, sanitation. So in this example, uh, near IR light is used to detect the gestures of a surgeon um, in the OR to control visuals on the monitor. So it can't be understated, right, why we measure near IR light. Um, an in increasing number of devices used in increasingly critical applications are depending more and more on the performance of sensing components. So this, of course, um, means that it must be, the light must be evaluated for accuracy. So let's talk about um, how a near IR light is produced. Uh, there's a few different light sources that can be used. We'll take a, a look at the light sources that produce the elim uh, illumination and signals for the near IR sensing systems, how they differ, and um, also their applications. So the, the applications are going to rely on either LED or laser-based sources for near IR emissions. And both can be used to enable object detection, ID, and tracking. Uh, near IR LEDs are used in devices from facial recognition to security cameras. Typically, they'll, they'll cast a wider distribution light, uh, but at a shorter range. And generally, they provide good light for, for 2D IR cameras. Near IR lasers are uh, precise and efficient and useful in long range sensing, and they can also be easily directed and diffracted. Um, so they're really good for structured light patterns, like arrays of dots for facial recognition. We'll talk about this a little bit more. We'll also talk about, in the context of lasers, VIXELs, which are virtual cavity, um, vertical cavity surface emitting lasers, and most likely the laser to be type, uh, type to be used in facial sensing uh, applications. And I, I promise not to read this slide to you, um, and it's not meant to be an exhaustive um, list of differences between LED lasers, but the basic takeaway is there's only a handful of differentiators between the sources, and of course, no single source is best for all applications. So in general, LEDs will distribute light over a wider area, and they tend to be generally eye safe and lower cost than lasers. Um, the downside is their distributions are shorter range than lasers, Wavelengths can be susceptible to changes in temperature, and their light's incoherent, meaning that the, the photons don't all travel um, in sync with one another. So it can make it difficult to direct LED light uh, without special optics. Um, Vixels uh, are chosen for their advantages in precision range and optical efficiency, also temperature stability and beam quality. Um, they're also coherent, which uh, allows them to produce very precise beams of light, maintaining quality and efficiency over distance. Of course, uh, they have additional safety requirements, and uh, there's usually a, a cost delta um, that makes them higher cost than, than LEDs. Okay. So let's talk about uh, the distributions here, uh, the beam distribution. As we mentioned, LEDs are advantageous for near IR sensing because they can cast a wide distribution of light um, with a much larger spot size than lasers, and we can illuminate a larger area pretty easily and effectively, um, giving IR cameras light they need to see at all times of the day. Uh, lasers, on the other hand, they're very precise, um, uniform illu illumination pattern in a smaller circular spot and much smaller uh, than an LED. And I like this, this slide. This, this says a lot in one slide. So near IR LEDs, they typically will have very wide beam angles. Um, standard is about 120 or plus or minus 60 degrees. And for sensing applications at close ranges, um, uh, the, the beam angles typically can be narrowed using optical elements, whereas near IR lasers produce a very focused uh, point of light. As, as we said, but this means out of the box that these sources aren't going to provide the adequate distribution of light to cover a face or a facial ID uh, specifically. So to create a wider beam angle necessary to do this, uh, diffractive optical elements, also known as DOEs, can be used to diffract a single laser beam into multiple points of light. Um, so the DOE has tiny apertures that split the laser into many emission points and they can create structured light patterns that have a broader distribution like an LED, but with a longer range because their intensity remains more consistent over distance. Uh, so 
So in some, some cases, we've seen um, DOEs cast uh, over 30,000 different points that, that are used uh, to uh, get, get that depth information uh, of a subject. So let's talk a little bit about range. Uh, as, as I mentioned, because of differences in coherence, LEDs will lose power and dissipate much sooner than the light of a, um, uh, coming from a laser. So um, it results in shorter range sensing capability. Um, the range limit of either will depend on the initial power of the light source, and you can get a more powerful source and sense our objects far away with, um, with a laser. Um, of course, as I mentioned, that, that may come with some safety implications. So in general, though, light sources used for close proximity sensor sensing are on the low end in terms of power requirements, and both LEDs um, could, do the, could potentially do the job in this case. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the application spaces for LEDs and lasers. Uh, due to the character characteristics just discussed. Uh, they're typically applied for different sensing methods, so they can be thought of as 2D for the purposes of maybe image analysis and 3D for depth and sensing, uh, depth sensing and uh, identification. For example, LEDs offer illumination for IR cameras in 2D applications, but for 3D applications, uh, LEDs can enable time of flight sensing and potentially stereo vision, and we'll talk about this a little bit more. And on their own, laser beams aren't broad or diffuse enough to provide light over a large area for cameras, so they tend to be used more so in time of flight sensing and for uh, structured light patterns. Okay. Uh, so in this example, we want a, a light source to eliminate an area for 2D imaging, and um, as we discussed, um, User, using a near our light doesn't distract the user and it can be used in a range of lighting conditions. So here the LED is typically pulsed to produce higher intensity light in short bursts. Then the light is reflected back to the IR camera and then converted to an electrical signal that produces our IR image. Uh, LED illumination for, in this case, used for eye tracking. So LEDs provide the light for the IR cameras to um, image the user's eyes in a VR headset, and then software calculates the pupil orientation, position, and gaze for, uh, for eye tracking. This is an example of time of flight. So a single LED or laser source can provide the time of flight data and allow that to be detected and calculate the position and depth of an object. So depending on how long the light takes to return to the sensor, it can determine where or how far the object surface is. This is kind of a neat slide as well. So this shows on the left uh, an illustration of an LED time of flight function for facial recognition. and um, this flood elimination it can be used in two ways. It's both to uh, know that the, the user is present in front of the sensor and what their proximity is, and then also provide an image for 2D facial ID. And on the right, we just show an animation showing time of flight function for 3D detection uh, of a hand. And then next would be stereo vision, right? So we have one near IR LED and then um, two IR cameras. Um, basically being used to determine basic object depth and position in a limited 3D space. Uh, as you might imagine, the more sensors we use to detect the, the light reflection here, the more dim dimensional information that we can get out of it. Uh, in this example, this is Intel's uh, RealSense depth camera using stereo vision that relies on the near IR laser dot pattern projector and it emits light over a full area, and then that light is received by a right and left IR camera, um, and that information is combined into a depth image that we see up here on the bottom right. Okay, and then lastly is uh, for 3D sensing with a laser. This is uh, a laser emitted through a DOE, so that's that um, diffracted pattern that casts an array of tiny individual, individual points onto a person's face, and then that light's reflected back 
um, from each of the points and received by the near IR sensor. And then uh, the, the sensing device then to use deformation, uses deformations of the dots from their original shapes and positions to determine the contours of the object. And so this grid um, is effectively used as a common, um, common way to, to uh, do facial ID. Okay, and then this is just a visual example of what a structured light pattern might look like. And the number of the patterns, number of points in a pattern vary based on the system that, but as I mentioned, it could be up to tens of, tens of thousands of, of uh, tiny points. And then the patterns will also vary by application. So the points could be dots, they could be short lines, um, whatever, whatever pattern the system's really expecting to receive. And then, as you might see on some of your devices, this is uh, an image of an iPhone X. And um, here we see a flood illuminator, which is basically an LED, LED with a, a diffuser in front of it that's going to emit uh, near IR light to be received by the prox uh, sensor. And here we show the dot projector and then also the infrared camera that is in place to receive. Uh, up to 30,000 points of structured near IR light. That'll be passed on to the user's face for facial ID. Okay, so the effect of, uh, of these application of applications, of course, depends on how they perform. So let's, uh, let's take a look at the performance uh, considerations for near IR light sources. Uh, so the questions we have to ask, so does the device have enough strength or intensity for the sensors to work correctly? However, especially in the case of facial uh, uh, face ID, as you can imagine, does the device provide too much light uh, for the eye to receive safely? And is the scope or pattern of the distribution itself, is that accurate? One of the things we talk about is signal to noise, right? So we see here, the LED laser projects and the IR camera receives that information, uh, but is that signal strong enough to overcome the noise, uh, potentially the ambient noise in the area? So um, if we uh, uh, plot the signal of the objects, for example, the dim object on the right, the signal is below the noise threshold, making it hard to distinguish. Uh, the one on the left, if we project it with enough intensity, then it is, um, uh, we know that we've got good signal to noise ratio and good intensity of the image. But of course, if it's if it's too intense, too strong, um, we have to be concerned with eye safety. So um, you know, lasers they're they're governed by IEC 60825, which sets uh, permissible exposure limits for different classes of sources. And man manufacturers may further restrict tolerances here um, to specific classes of light sources. But in effect, that basically we want to ensure that, that lasers and LEDs meet, meet minimum tolerances, but don't exceed maximum tolerances for output power. Um, and it's based on two things, the total output of the distribution and then power at each point across the distribution. So the things we want to measure is um, we want to start with light output in several directions. So this is a directional emission of light in angular space. Uh, this is the space limited by the beam's angle as discussed. And we measure the power radiated uniformly um, by the source in all directions uh, by its radiant flux. And so that, that uh, measure is, or it's measured in watts, and we can think of this as the total near IR light that the source produces in uh, near IR space. And then if we look at a slice of the space, we get a solid angle of light source, and that's measured in stradians. And then we also have, um, lastly here, the radiant intensity, which is the power of the light at a given angle, and that's measured in watts per stradian. Um, so that's literally the radiant flux. And so while the radiant flux can give us the source's total output power, radiant intensity can give us the power at a specific directional point in angular space. Okay, so what do we want to measure? Do we want to look at the intensity of, a, a, of one spot or of this spot? Um, or do we want to know are all the spots uniform, right? So these are some of the con considerations that we're thinking of um, as, we're, as we're taking measurements here. 
Um, so this brings us to the measurement methods themselves to measure these qualities and ensure the performance, okay? And so, as we mentioned, LEDs, they have broad angular distributions, structured light uh, patterns, um, need to characterize thousands of dots and uh, when they're produced by a laser. So ideally, the measurement system can address both scenarios. So we'll want to determine if an iron near IR light source produces sufficient but safe light. And um, sometimes these angular emissions are broad in the case of LEDs or dot patterns. And the, the challenge is to, to measure everything uh, within the field of view uh, to, to get good, uh, good information. So let's talk about traditionally, traditional methods. Uh, two methods here, one is goniometric. And we can rotate, uh, here, here it's actually, this is shown radiance sig 400, and we can rotate the camera through um, uh, plus or minus 120 degrees of inclination angle and 360 degrees of azimuth. And we can really get a good, um, good accurate representation of what this distribution looks like. The limitations are these systems can be large and can be costly and then require thousands of rotations um, in front of the imager. So this means it's time consuming. So of course, this might not be practical for, for a structured light pattern. Uh, and of course, you can you can think in in production. This this of course would not be a uh, uh, potentially a very efficient way it means of measurement. So this brings us to the challenge of this measurement. Right, I mentioned that more than thirty thousand near IR points could be uh, measured. Are the expected number of dots uh, there uh, being emitted being shown? Are they forming the correct patterns? And what is the intensity of each, of each point? And then our six, second example as a traditional method, this is uh, uh, showing a radiance on a wall. The issue here, while it's nice that we only have um, one component, um, you may need a large area to do this, so a large room to do it. And we're not actually measuring the device directly, right? We're measuring uh, the, the, the wall that's being used here. So we don't have a good direct measurement of the device. And then as you can imagine, this isn't something that you'd wanna do in production either. So as more and more of these devices are using uh, near IR sensing, um, they're going to be, need to be measured in production. So maybe there's a better way of doing this. Uh, in production where we capture all angular emissions of light, we measure accurate radiometric values, and then we can verify the intensity and position of, of the dots, and then also do this in much shorter time frames. So this is where Radiance um, development team stepped in and developed a Fourier optic lens that we'll talk about. And this is it. So unlike the traditional method, um, a Fourier optic lens is compact, it's fully integrated in a single camera system. And so this shows um, our radiometric Y series with the conoscope lens for plus or minus 70 degree measurement of 850 or 940 sources. Okay, so these are the components here. I mentioned the uh, radiometric Y16 coupled with a near IR intensity lens using Fourier optics to map every angle uh, to a specific pixel in the CCD. And again, as we think of the, the top measurement concerns, uh, the speed of the, the measurement process is one thing, right? So by using the conoscope lens, we can capture a full cone of data in one measurement. So there's no need for moving components or, or moving the device itself. It stays stationary, the DUT stays stationary, and we can measure, uh, as I mentioned, the full cone of data in one measurement. Okay, angular, angular measurement accuracy. So we can measure all angles plus or minus 70 degrees, and the resolution is 0 0.05 degrees per image sensor pixel. So a lot of information in one uh, snapshot. And then of course, the size, cost, and complexity of, a measure, of the measurement equipment itself, right? So as compared to the, the SIG 400, the goniometric device that we showed earlier, 
uh, we can now replace this with a single camera and lens solution. And um, for production purposes, it's much more compact and turnkey of a form factor, so it can be easily integrated. Okay. And then again, uh, the, the, the performance considerations at the production level. So we can, if in R&D we measured on the goniometer, now we can compare that with um, by using the, um, the, the conoscope lens. And so from everywhere, from R&D to production, we can measure these devices, capture um, the measurements quickly. Typically the measurements will take uh, a second or two, and then we have software that will call TT nearing that will go and uh, do different uh, analyses on the information produced and give us a good representation of the the, uh, the light sources that, that we're using. So the things that we can measure, total flux, max power, radiant intensity, uh, points of interest, and POI power, solid angle, inclination solid angle. And then we can also look into things like uniformity or find hot spots or fall off angles. Uh, things like that. And then all of these are plotted, of course, against its inclination and azimuth position. This is uh, just a quick snapshot of the test library, so uh, the, the analyses that I uh, already mentioned. And then this is a simple radar plot in our TT NERI software. So as you can imagine, with a NIR IR LED, that's going to be pretty uniform uh, as, as a function of angle, right? And then this is uh, also a, a false color image shown of a flood source within TT Neary. And what we care about here is uniformity across all the angular emissions, so um, attention, intensity at every degree. And so we can compare those things within software and make sure that we have good uniform distribution. And of course, any, any hot spots as well. One measurement that customers ask for is full with half max. So we can take an angular cross-section that defines the primary area for the intensity measurement. And then as mentioned, you see here a little bit what looks like kind of a starry night, right? So these are all the points that are projected. And in this case, I think this was upwards of about 35,000, 40,000 points. Um, and then we can measure the total flux of uh, total power that's involved here. Or we can actually look and see what the, the radiant intensity as is at each individual point here. So we will draw a, a point of interest uh, indicator around each of these uh, points of light and show you what the intensity is at that, at that angle. And that's illustrated here. Okay, so the idea is that points of interest for dot source analysis uh, effectively ensure that the patterns that are projected are all at the correct angle. And of course, this you know, is determined how, by how well it is uh, positioned uh, in front of the, the lens. But then we can measure the, the intensity at inclination and azimuth, and we report that out in watts per gradient. Okay. And so this is data output, right? So after the measurement is taken, what is the type of data, the location of pixels, and in inclination azimuth? intensity and watts per stradian, uh, average intensity, solid angle. Um, I mentioned uniformity, right? So spot power uniformity and percentage, uh, total flux, DOE flux, and then image export. So wrapping up here, we've only got a few more minutes. Um, let's just talk about the, the advantage here, right? So we have one integrated camera and lens solution, an all-in-one Fourier optic system, as opposed to a, a goniometric system. So this reduces cost and complexity. It's easier to integrate in production. Of course, in production, due to the time limitations of a goniometric device, uh, the, the NERI lens system eliminates, eliminates that. And to go along with that, we have dedicated software analysis that will allow us to, to do accurate measurements of, of how the devices are emitting in space. Okay. And then one tool. So if we're, we're doing LED distribution versus maybe a structured light pattern, the same tool can be measured to, to can be used to, to measure uh, millions of, of data points or a single uh, LED distribution. Uh, so wrapping up, in summary, 
uh, we're seeing a larger and larger number of device functions relying on the performance of these sensing systems in near IR. Uh, each of those must be measured to ensure accurate intensity and distribution, but then also uh, safety considerations must be considered as well to make sure we're not providing too much light to the user. And one fast solution to this is our near IR intensity lens. Uh, so it's an efficient solution for near IR source measurement and ideal for high volume production testing uh, in electronics, AR, VR, and other, other applications. So thank you. Sorry, I tried to wrap up a little quickly there at the end. Um, if there are other questions, feel free to uh, ask at info at radiant uh, VS Dot com. That's our uh, uh, email address for any questions you might have. And as John mentioned, this slide deck will be available in PDF format, so we'll send that out. But if there are any questions, happy to help. Um, uh, just let me know. And with that, I'll, uh, I guess we could start the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, so yes, we're in the Q&A portion of the webcast. So once again, to submit a question, just use the Q&A box on your console. First question, does this system only measure the bare diode or can it measure the source as integrated into a device? Good question, yeah. So I take this to mean integrated into a device. So of course, if it's integrated as part of a structured light pattern, then I think we've answered that question. If, this, if, if what they, is meant by a device is um, at the component level or at what, what is referred to as the module level. So of course, um, when these devices or components are put into a, a housing, uh, let's say a VR headset, can we measure it there? As long as we can get, we basically need the conoscope lens to be within three millimeters of the DUT. And as long as we can uh, maintain that, then we should be able to measure it. So it doesn't really matter what it's integrated into as long as you can maintain that working distance. We should be able to get a uh, 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 good measurement off of it. Okay. Next, does the TTNIRI software work without the, the conoscope but with the Prometric L16 camera with lens for radiometric measurement? Uh, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? Yeah. Does the TTNIRI software work without the conoscope, but with the Prometric, and I think it's L16, it could be L16 or I16, camera okay, yep. with lens for, for radiometric measurement? Uh, potentially, we'd have to look into it. I think if I'm understanding it right, um, there, it wouldn't be L16, it might be I16. So it's possible that what um, somebody wants to do, it would be a little bit more of a custom, but, but potentially it could be. But, but the, for doing radiometric, we would use TT Neary um, as the software package for that. Yes. Okay. Um, Next. Why is there a specification for measuring 940 or 850 nanometers? Are other wavelength measurements possible? Very good question. So the devices that the NERI devices have um, coatings that are at 850 and 940, and so those are optimized for specific applications at those wavelengths. However, if you do have uh, questions at different wavelengths, then yes, we can certainly entertain those. So you would you would bring that question to me or bring that application to me, and then I would work with engineering to see if we can facilitate. Um, I will say that the CCD, their range of, of spectral sensitivity is between about 350 and let's call it 1050. So above 1050, not so much, but we're always willing to uh, take a look and see if we can accommodate. Uh, but for that range from 350 to 1050, certainly we can uh, uh, entertain entertain those as well. 850 and 940 just seem to be, for the reasons that we discussed during the presentation, the um, the sweet spots for measurement. Mm -hmm. 
How does the accuracy of the traditional uh, method, for example, a radiance on a wall, compare with the conoscope method? Yeah, another great question. So typically, um, I, would, I, would, I would just say in general, the, the goniometric measurement is going to be more accurate uh, and more uh, comprehensive, let's just say, right? Because you're taking uh, potentially thousands of measurements. Of course, a measurement uh, in that regard could take up to about eight hours to do, maybe even longer sometimes. So what we do is we will characterize a source on a goniometer on our SIG 400, and then we will take a relative measurement with the conoscope, uh, the near IR lens, and correlate the two, right? So we, we found that we can get really good correlation of the information taken on the near IR intensity uh, lens to the goniometric device. And then from there, uh, basically it's a, it's a relative measurement and everything should be repeatable from there on out, when, uh, when, especially when, when used in, in production, right? So how do I know this is going to be a good production device? Well, I would compare it to what I did with the, the SIG 400 and then uh, uh, you know, make that determination. But in general, it co correlates very highly with what we see on the SIG. Mm -hmm. How long is a typical measurement time? You know, as, as, as a sales guy, I hate answering by it depends, but it depends. It depends on what you mean by a measurement, right? And so a measurement could be, do I, do I click a button and then I take a, just take a camera image and that's it. Um, more typically what's meant by a measurement is the time to do it, what I just said, and then also to analyze the data, right? So taking a measurement is a matter of a second or two. Uh, it's then the number of analyses that you put on top of that measurement. So that, can, that could take uh, potentially um, in the tens of seconds, right, to do that if you have enough analyses. And that's usually in the case of a structured light pattern where I have to analyze tens of thousands of dots. But in general, I would say most applications, they're taking a quick snapshot, and then within a couple of seconds, they have an answer for uh, typically for total, total power or um, uh, maybe specific hotspots in, a, in, a, uh, in the environment. Mm -hmm. Is there a specific test for full width half max? We do have a task. So within TT Neary, there is, um, I think I mentioned a little bit in the, in the presentation, we can do uh, cross sections uh, for that, right? So we can create a cross section. Um, we'll find the centroid of the flood source, then take cross sections at user find angles. And then we can compute a variety of things. So full width half max, uh, full width 90 max, rising and falling edge slopes, um, edge slope width, uh, average, average radiant intensity of the cross section. So, with that cross section tool, yes, to answer the question, we can do a full with half max within TT Neri. If the light source is being shown through a diffuser, can the intensity be measured across the diffuser? Yes. So, a diffuser, um, you know, a diffuser DOE, effectively, it's, it's, we think of it the same way. Um, a diffuser may mean flood source, so maybe that's a little bit more um, condensed of, of, a, of an image, I guess I'd say, or a DUT. So in either case, um, a flood source is typically measured for uniformity. You're not typically pulling out each point uh, where you are with structured light. But yes, we can, we can do either. We can measure uh, both flood sources and structured light sources. Um, so if it's a diffuser, my guess is the intent of the question is as maybe a flood source, and typically, like I said, you're measuring the uniformity of that of that light source. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd, I'd say we have time for about three more questions, but I do want to say to the audience that if your question has not been answered on air, don't worry about it, because they are sent to the presenter, Mike, who can answer them later. Uh, next question. What is the largest size emitting device measurable? The largest size, is that meant by physical size? That's, that would be my guess, but that's just the question. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there, there's a couple of ways, I guess, to answer that question. Um, 
we do have a sampling size of up to four millimeter diameter for the near IR lens. Um, and then we have two versions of the, uh, the, um, the Y16 imaging radiometer and the NERI lens that, that go along with it. So one is for a working distance, as I mentioned, of uh, three millimeters. I didn't, what I didn't mention is we also have one that measures at 30 millimeters. So if by size we mean um, uh, height, uh, we can accommodate a working distance of 30 millimeters as well as three millimeters. The sampling size is a four millimeter diameter. And then those produce, in the case of a 30 millimeter working distance, that's a field of view of plus or minus 50 degrees. And in the case of the three millimeter working distance, that's a field of view of plus or minus 70 degrees. So hopefully okay. that answers the question. Yep. yep. Actually, this next question will be the last question. We're running out of time. So uh, what units are used to measure the uniformity of a source? Oh, okay, yeah, so for uniformity, I guess I was thinking more in units of the uh, the total power and um, intensity. Um, for for uniformity, it's measured as basically a percentage and uh, a, a tolerance can be set. So that percentage must be, um, it passes or fails based on a percentage uniformity across the full field of view, right? And so if I exceed um, the difference in, let's say, intensity, of, of one section versus the other, then I can pass or fail based on tolerancing set. So it's a, it's a user scalable or set tolerance that allows me to pass or fail based on uh, how uniform the device is or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the, the last, very last question will come from me. And do you have any closing remarks you'd like to make? Uh, th yeah, just thanks again. Thanks for everybody for uh, for joining us today. I, I know everybody's busy right now, and uh, thanks to to you guys, John, for for hosting us. Um, if there are any questions, like I said, my role is is here to gather information as far as applications that you might have, and then I work with a team of application engineers on a potential solution. So a lot of times that's an off the shelf solution. Sometimes that might be a custom solution. Um, we also have threads within our company, both in optics and software development. So if you have something that's a little out of the box, and let's say it's something that's a different wavelength and you have different analyses that you want to do, we're well equipped to help you to do that. So feel free to reach out to me and um, with your questions and potential applications, um, and we'd love to help. Thanks again.